Good day, everyone. This is your teacher, Ms. Mars, and in today's video lecture, I am going to continue our topic on Unit 3. And uh, in the previous video lecture, we talked about Lesson 1, um, which is all about prose. And this time, we will progress and go to Lesson 2, which is all about drama. So allow me to share my screen to you so we can start with our discussion today. So drama, drama is one of the genres really that we all, you know, we all enjoy. Um, we definitely, there are different types of drama and they are meant to be performed and we enjoy every single drama, okay? So drama as a literary genre, it is realized in performance. What I had said, it is ought to be performed. It's not ought to be read. Well, we can read it, you can read a script, but its purpose, why do people create script, is for it to be performed. So Robert Diani actually describes it as staged art. So it should be performed on stage. And a drama, that's the, the basic premise of drama, which is it, it should be performed on stage. And though there are a lot of dramas now, like for example, if we say the radio drama, they don't perform it, they perform it on, over radio. But the idea here of drama is that it should be performed by those people who are playing the characters that, you know, that, are, at, that are included in that drama. So it is a literary form and it is actually designed for the theater, okay? So especially before, a um, long time ago, when we also know that William Shakespeare happened to be really famous uh, dramatist playwright, okay? He is a famous playwright and he has written a lot of dramas such as Hamlet, Macbeth, um, even Romeo and Juliet, the very famous Romeo and Juliet. So. Um, of course, it is designed for the theater because characters are assigned roles and they should act out their roles as the action is enacted on stage. So that's the very essence of drama. And these characters, it can be human beings, dead, it could also be spiritual beings, animals, or abstract quality. So like, I mean, there, are, there could really be a lot of um, characters, not only like we we kind of restrict or, or just um, limit to humans, but we could also have characters such as animals, spiritual beings. Well, it depends on, on the drama itself. It depends on the script. So drama is an adaptation, recreation, and reflection of reality on stage. So uh, there are things happening, you know, in real and playwright create a drama of it and they perform it on stage. That is why it is an adaptation on what is really happening. It is a creation and it could be a reflection. So let's try to take a look at here, this, uh, these pictures. So uh, what is drama? Drama, it is a story enacted on stage for a live audience. So of course, uh, the very the very essence or the very definition of drama is we go to the theater and we definitely watch uh, the characters performed the drama. So it's just very basic. Um, it's self-explanatory. And there are a live audience. Uh, there is a live audience looking at uh, the performers. So that's, how, that's what drama is all about. And drama, it is an imitation of life. It is also different from other forms of literature because of its unique characteristics, such as it, it is ought to be performed. It is read, but basically it is composed really for a performance or to be performed. So we don't just create a drama and then, you know, just publish it without um, the intention or the goal for it to be performed. So drama is something that, you know, the author wrote it for the purpose of performance. So it should be performed. And um, it should also be presented. So the ultimate aim of dramatic composition is it to be presented on a stage before a light, before an audience. So you can just imagine 
um, how exciting it would be, you know, if we can, you know, watch, like, for example, um, in Miss Saigon, you know, we know that because our, our very own Leia Salong happened to take part of Miss Saigon before. So if we could, you know, look into or watch that kind of performance and even here local shows local dramas so I remember when I was young during fiesta the people who are actors coming from from the local AM station DYHP they usually go to the towns and bring with them their props and then they just present a drama so that's how it was before you know I was still young that time but now it's different already as as years pass by, of course, it's different. But of course, uh, we do have uh, different types of dramas. You know, we can listen to radio. Uh, dramas are also performed on TV. But um, the basic premise is that drama should really be performed on stage before an audience. Then other variations of drama just uh, came out, you know, as everything progresses, as things change. And, and as everything becomes high tech or, or, or become technology in oriented in, in such a way. So the term drama is used at the following three different levels. Number one, of course, for performance. Number two, it's a composition. And obviously, it's a branch under a branch of literature. So drama is really a huge um, genre that we can explore on. And performance, let's try to take a look at now all these three for all these three levels. So for performance, drama, remember this drama is used for plays that are acted on stage, or it could also be on screen as what I had told you. Like now we are watching drama on TV, on, on, you know, on, on our gadgets, because those things are you know, created as movies and we watch them on Netflix and, and stuff like that. And these plays are different from musical performance because they must tell stories which are acted out by actors and actresses as well. The, the example I gave earlier about Miss Saigon, Miss Saigon is it's a musical. So here, a drama is a different from musical performance because the drama here tells stories. But the idea that I wanted to, you know, just kind of communicate with you that time is that drama should be performed on stage, just like musical, okay? Like there should be people watching. And, and of course, I remembered, you know, as I told you when I was young during Town Fiesta, actors from DYHP, they come over and then they would present a drama. So that is an example. It's a live, okay? It's a live drama, drama show. So that is an example. Next for the composition, drama is used to describe a dramatic composition, okay, which employs language and pantomime to present a story or a series of events, which again, these series of events are intended to be performed. Sometimes, especially with written compositions, they may not be presented on stage, but this does not stop it from being a drama, okay? Because the written compositions, what if, yeah, you wrote a drama and then it wasn't, you know, it wasn't chosen to be presented on stage. It does not mean that it is no longer a drama. What you wrote is no longer a drama just because it wasn't uh, presented on stage. Of course, the composition itself, it is still drama. So that's why there are different levels, the performance, the composition. And now the third one, it's a branch of literature. So drama is a term used for that branch of literature that covers dramatic composition. So you know already that drama is a literary art and the basic difference actually class between drama and other forms of literature, let's say prose and poetry is that drama is written in dialogue from the beginning until the end. So dialogue form like the characters are talking. For example, we have uh, five characters. So all these five characters are talking, okay? And there could just be a little bit of a narration, but what really is um, dominant here is the dialogue among the characters. And that's what makes it different from prose and poetry. So there are elements of drama. We do have number one, imitation. So imitation, it means the copying somebody or something. And 
we know what imitation is. And because drama is like a reflection of what is happening in real or like an adaptation and recreation. So that that's why this is one of its elements. No, It is an act of copying the way somebody talks and behaves, especially to entertain people. And in literature, imitation class is used to describe actually something that is real. And then we are going to portray it. So it is a reproduction of natural objects and action or a portrayal of something realistic. And that's what happened when we, when we present or when we create a drama and present it on stage. And then in drama, imitation is more pronounced in performance. So we can really see um, the imitation because, especially when it is performed, it is more evident when the drama is performed but if it's not you would not really like appreciate drama if it's not being performed what is being imitated in drama is basically life itself and it ties to present life as realistically as possible on stage so that's why it's an imitation this is why we say we say class that drama mirrors life because the the genre of drama you also know that it is not always like a bed of roses but it could be like how human beings really experience in terms of you know a lot of challenges what and, and everything like that so that's why it is the 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 thing that mirrors life because it's an imitation of of the of life and that's number two the second element is plot so the plot as the organization of action was traditionally conceived as a sequence of important moments arranged chronologically. So that means there is um, specific arrangement in terms of the plot. We have introduction. We do also series of complications. That's why there is conflict. And when these series of, or when these uh, various conflicts would pile up, that would eventually lead to the climax. So the climax is clinching the fate of the central characters. And after the climax, the tension would go down. Definitely something would be like being solved. And that is now the resolution and then the noma that concludes and summarizes the issues. So there are also some um, way now in, in drama, especially on screen, as I noticed, that they tend to... Um, have first the climax okay like something that is um and then they tend to have a backstory so that this tension could be explained but nevertheless these are the you know the stages of plot exposition and then when complications or tensions build 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 up okay we could reach the climax it is where the tension is at as its highest point and then it goes down and then suddenly we get settled and that is the resolution and then the conclusion and the summarization that would be the denoma. Plot is the organization of a series of action or events, usually moving through conflicts to a climax and resolution. So the arrangement here often implies casualty and, uh, and achieves certain effects. So plot refers to the organization of all elements into a meaningful pattern. And it is obviously the overall structure of the play. Imagine your drama without a plot. So it would not really be interesting. What is it? Is it just an essay? So plot lays out the series of events that form the entirety of the play. And it's also it also serves as our structural framework. And it brings the events to cohesion and sense. Okay, so there will be cohesive form and sense because all the events or all the stages of plot are obviously related with one another. Like the, the previous one is the one leading to the next and so on and so forth. Okay, dramatic plot is also expected to produce a result or an effect on the audience. And the playwright here, the one who creates or who makes drama class is known as the playwright, therefore tries to fashion his play in a particular way to produce a particular impression on his audience. So we have here the beginning introduction or exposition, and then we do have the rising, and then the, the one in the highest peak, the highest peak that would be our climax, and then we fall down, and then we have the ending, or we do also have the order resolution. So this is how it is. So this is Gustav Freytag triangle of a drama. And this is true. 
after we um, you know reach this line we're gonna go back okay and everything else is a cycle that's life naman diba um, in, 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 in our lives I mean there are just a lot of stories happening in our lives no? countless of stories and all these stories are really um, or the episodes countless episodes and all these episodes that we have when put together would definitely talk about our life as a whole So in, in every episode that we encounter, we always started with an exposition. And then there would be instances that we could come across with something like conflict, and then we would have the climax, and then the falling and the resolution, and everything else goes back and forth again and again. Okay, especially if we're talking about the, um, you know, the little bit of, of episodes or every episode to come up or to 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 be able to um, tell our own story in our life. Next, we do have here um, very specific or like basically questions that we could look into for every stage of the plot. What information does the writer give you at the beginning of the story? That is your exposition. For the rising action, What event in the rising action drew you in most as a reader? So this is what you can ask yourself. For the conflict, what types of conflicts are pre present in the story? And how were you able to identify them? For the climax, this is often considered the most exciting or suspenseful part of the story. As yes, like all the confrontation is here, like all the characters are just really like in huge trouble here. And then falling action. In what way is the action in this part of the story different from the first part? And then lastly, resolution. How does this part of the story make you feel? And what else could the writer have done? So this is uh, the stages of our plot. Next, dramatic action. So the dramatic action class, it is a series of incidents that are logically arranged by the playwright to achieve specific response like joy, okay, pity, Fear, indignation, ridicule, laughter, thoughtful contemplation from the audience. So this is one of the elements. And the dramatic action, it includes what the character fails to do. Okay, for example, in Hamlet, the popular code to be or not to be refers to the action. So our dramatic action a series of incidents that logically arrange by the playwright to achieve specific response okay and this response could vary from the positive um, emotions or feelings down to the negative ones and um, example here is Hamlet okay to be or not to be this refers to that action the dramatic action number four is dialogue we know also that when we write or playwright to write dramas and everything like is a dialogue you know so in drama The entire story is presented in dialogue. A conversation between characters in a literary work, of course, we call it also script, no? Dialogue brings characters to life by revealing their personalities and by showing what they are thinking and feeling as they react to other characters. So dialogue could be described as a verbal interchange of thoughts or ideas. And the Oxford Dictionary actually explains that dialogue involves two or more people and could be in the form of expression. It could also be in a form of a conversation, just a talk or a chat or a TTA, TT, chit chat, debate, okay, argument. It could also have exchange of views, discussion, conference, converse, interlocution, confabulation, gossip, even, parley, palaver, spoken part, script, and line. So these are some of the you know things that we are going to have a dialogue or exchange of um, thoughts no with others through verbal this is our dialogue and then drama is presented only in dialogue so that it should be designed in such a way through it the reader or audience must be able to infer the nature the nature of each character the public and private relationship among the several characters, the past as well as the present circumstances of the various characters. And when these characters um, start to deliver their lines or their dialogues, we are not just going to look into also the, the language or the tone or whatsoever, you know, the supra-segmental 
phonemes, but rather we should we should also look into the um, not not only the segmental phonemes, but rather we should also look into the suprasegmental phonemes, like even their expressions, because through their facial expressions while they are talking, we can also um, extract, you know, how does this person feel. And then there are dramatic techniques. So the dramatic techniques are the following, characterization. Characterization classes the playwright's imaginative creation of characters that can effectively dramatize his story. So the action of the play is presented through such characters. And since drama frequently does without a narrator, we need to have characterization. So it takes place through stage directions, dialogue, action, setting, and symbols. So the characterization is you are um, asking for real people to try to effectively dramatize the envisioned character of the author. Next, character analysis, the ability to create characters and to ensure that they blend or suit the action of the plays that we refer to as characterization. So it is called the character. Characters class, it refers to the people who play the, who act the play and uh, that is easy. This is easy to understand. No? What can readers learn through characterization? So if we do characterization, uh, students or learners would be able to learn about behavior. How does the character act? What is the appearance of the character? How old is the character? Right? The gender is the character a male or female or he or she belongs to an LGBT, LGBTQIA plus um, you know, category. We'll also look into the education, education of, of the, of the uh, characters and the vocation also of the characters and types of characters. Now, I know because this is just a review, so we are not going to dwell so much, you know, on this one. When we say types, we have the protagonist or the hero. So being the hero, this is the main character. And if he is pitted against an important character, like in Hamlet, the opponent is called an antagonist. So kung naasya mo bully niya, naasya yung mga kuan, we call that the antagonist. And that is the opposite of protagonist. So we do also have another type of character, like dynamic around characters. So this character actually changes over the course of the story. In most cases, he grows from innocence to maturity or from being ignorant to being knowledgeable. So he is consistently alert to his environment with its attendant problem and reacts accordingly. And then we have your example, Shrek. Okay, Shrek is really Shrek. No, protagonist is Shrek, antagonist Lord Farquaad stands in his way, kills ogres and tries to keep Shrek and Fiona apart. Shrek is a dynamic character because he changes throughout the story. He becomes softer and lets people into his in and let people into his life. Shrek is round because we see his strengths and weaknesses. He seems like a real person. Just like a real person, we see that person's uh, strength and weakness. And we do have also static, flat, or stock character. This is the opposite of dynamic or round. Because the round definitely changes, but the static is the here the character is complex and does not change in any basic way in the course of the story. He is presented in outline without much individualization. And he is usually stable and is said to be static because he retains essentially the same outlook, the same attitudes, values, and dispositions from the beginning until the end of the story. When we talk about flat characters, so now let's try to take a look at, um, you know, a video uh, about flat characters. This will just be an additional um, information. When we talk about flat characters and round characters, what we mean is that there is a difference between, or some kind of distinction between characters who are superficial, predictable, or otherwise not very sophisticated. We usually call these characters flat. And on the other hand, round characters, characters that have a certain kind of depth or complexity. And the question is, what exactly is this, is this depth? What makes a round character more interesting or more complex? If we look at a very famous narrative, let's take for example the very first Star Wars movie, Episode 4, A New Hope, 1977. We can see that Luke Skywalker, for example, is a good character. How do we know that he's good? 
Well, he has blue eyes, he has blonde hair, he wears white. We can talk about that when we talk about symbolism, as opposed to Darth Vader, who is a bad character. How do we know he's bad? He's dressed in black, of course, which is very predictable and very superficial. How do we know that Obi-Wan Kenobi is a good character? He has white hair, he has a white beard, he looks like a religious figure like a monk or someone who is pure and so on and so forth. What I would like to suggest is that these characters are flat characters. Not that they're not interesting. I think it's a fascinating narrative with captivating and memorable characters. I've watched it many times. But I do have to admit that there is not a lot of depth to these characters in the sense that they are for the most part stable. They are rarely confused and their behavior doesn't really confuse us. It's true that Luke Skywalker at the beginning is reluctant to join the rebellion, but once he does, that's it. He's committed to the cause. He never has second thoughts. He's completely dependable. He never does anything that is selfish or shocking or controversial or uncharacteristic. I think that when we talk about round characters, we're ultimately talking about characters who defy the whole idea of moral dichotomy. In other words, round characters cannot be referred to in terms of good or bad, or good and evil, or right and wrong. So if, if we take, for example, a more complex narrative, Wise Blood, a famous uh, American novel by Flannery O'Connor, we can see a set of characters that are much more complicated than the superficial distinction between, or division into good and bad. The main character, Hazel Motes, is a young man who is an anti-preacher. He's against religion, he hates God, he hates Jesus. And he starts, or he founds, his own church. He calls it the Church Without Christ. Paradoxically, he is completely devoted to the Church Without Christ. He has a lot of faith in the Church Without Christ. He's an absolute believer in the truth of the Church Without Christ, which means that He's a very honest, very sincere, very serious person. When he's confronted by frauds, people who pretend to be representing God, but are actually in the religion business to make money, he kills one of them. In that sense, he plays the role of an angry biblical prophet, Elijah, for example. He's violent, he's self-tortured. Toward the end of the novel, he blinds himself, and at the very end, he's willing to make the ultimate sacrifice and die. For the, sake of, for the sake of truth, for the sake of showing people that they are being deceived by fake preachers and false prophets. We could say that he really becomes a Christ figure. And it's very strange because he's not a very sympathetic character. He's not a lovable character. He's not Luke Skywalker. He's controlled by rage. He's a killer. He rejects the people who follow him and who love him, his own disciples, and he ends up dead. But that's a round character. Naturally, some characters in this novel are flat. These are all the greedy people who pretend to be righteous while cheating everybody in sight. For example, the landlady, Mrs. Flood, a sweet, old, lonely woman who I think is a horrible person and not so sweet at all. She's gluttonous and avaricious, and she doesn't change throughout the novel, even if she claims she does. It's interesting that we are often trained to look for depth when we examine literary characters, and sometimes it's hard for us to accept the fact that certain characters remain flat in spite of our tendency to think about them in terms of growth or transformation or some kind of an epiphany. I think that the point is that good fiction often presents a curious interplay of flat characters and round characters, and it's not always easy to tell which is which. Yeah, so the video class give us really a good, um, um, you know, scenario when we say the, it is a flat character and a round character, give us good differences between the two. So I know that you probably understood this one very well, and also this is just a review to you. So now let's proceed to the next technique, which is foreshadowing. Foreshadowing actually are when you kind of see hints so that you would be able to try to um, guess what's going to happen next. So a literary device in which an author mentions or hints at something that will happen later in the story. 
So you can think of foreshadowing, it is a way of giving the character a chance to make a prediction. And, you know, we always do that. Diba? Mga nanautag mga series would say, oh, klaro kain na si Kuan mamatay. Klaro kain na si Kuan. Yeah, things like that. Klaro kain na si magkadayon sila, di ba? Things like that. So that means if you say that, you as the, as the viewer, you are already foreshadowing. And that is an element of a drama or not an element, but a technique. And drama refers to actions, words, events, incidents, or other things in a play that predict future occurrence in the play. And it contributes to the mood and general atmosphere of the play, obviously. And Hamlet provides a very good example for us. We encounter a ghost at the beginning of the play and its appearance creates an atmosphere of fear. So, kita man ta sa ghost, of course, nanatay mga inkling or we already have hints. Okay, let's try to take a look at foreshadowing. At the beginning of the play, Hamlet is mourning his father's death and agonizing over his mother's marriage to his uncle Claudius. Watchmen alert the prince to the appearance of a ghost who looks very much like the dead King Hamlet. Hamlet waits for the ghost to appear and finds that it is his father, dressed in battle gear and stuck in limbo because he was murdered without being forgiven for his earthly sins. The murderer? Of course, it is Claudius who purportedly put poison in the king's ears while he was napping in the garden. The young prince is assigned the task of revenging his father's death. There is an element of foreshadowing in the fact that the departed king is dressed for battle. Soldiers from Norway are preparing to attack Denmark. This issue will come out to both the characters and the audience a bit later in the action. Later, Hamlet has an opportunity to kill Claudius while he kneels in prayer, but restrains himself because he does not want his uncle to die without heavenly forgiveness, as King Hamlet did. Okay, so I believe uh, the, the video gives us really a good example of how foreshadowing works. Next is planting. So in drama, one of the techniques that is used to present the action of the play is planting. It is use of certain props to give more information about some characters, the environment, or situation. So we make use of props, backdrop whatsoever that would give us also like the feeling on the environment or situations going to happen on the drama. And then they use ex machina. Okay, they use ex machina. This is a Latin phrase and it's a god from the machine. In Greek theater, it describes a technique used by some playwrights to end their plays with a god okay, who was lowered to the stage by a mechanical apparatus and by his judgment and commands solve the problems of the human characters. So this is the use ex machina. This is how it's, um, you know, done. So play within the play, as the name suggests, a play within the play is a play that is created in another play. Usually it is a complete play with a beginning, middle, and an end. And it has its own theme, which in many cases is related to the theme of the main play. It is created for a particular purpose. So Morabag, it's a play within the play. So there is a bigger play, and then ang kananga play divide siya into smaller plays. Play within the play, a play that is being performed in the confines of another play. Yeah, the character of the play, watch the play being performed. Okay. So, for example, Kani, uh, there is a play that the characters within that play um, are watching. So, it's like there are two plays, no? the, the, the original play or the bigger play and also the play that you can see and the characters are watching. The readers are not the intended audience of the play within the play, but the intended audience of the play within the play are the characters of the main play. Okay, next setting. It is the location of a play, and it's the time and place when and where the action of the play takes place. Setting is very important in a play because it helps us to appreciate the background of the play. And it's also really like um, one of the things that we have to make, no? the kaning yung setting. Also in productions, it helps the designers design appropriate local, atmosphere, and costume for the play. So this is uh, it for lesson two class. We will end at the techniques uh, of drama and the last is setting. So I hope you learned a thing or two. And next lesson, we will go on to lesson three, which is survey of prose authors and dramatists. And after lesson three, we will, um, com we will culminate unit three with uh, lesson four because there are only four lessons. So thank you very much for watching. I am, 
I hope you learned a thing or two, as I said earlier. And God bless everyone and keep safe. Till next video lecture, we are going to talk about survey of um, playwright and dramatist and, and also lesson four. I will see you then. Bye, everyone.